Welcome back, everybody. Russ Barkley here. Uh, exciting times ahead. Looks like next week we're going to have National Talk Like a Pirate Day. Might even be an international celebration. So get ready for that one. <laughs> of course. So this week in our research review, we've got several what I think are pretty important studies to talk about. The others are listed over in the thumbnail sketch. And as always, if I talk about an article, I give you the hot link over to that article in case you want to read about it. So uh, let's get started. The first one that we're going to talk about uh, is very important and is related to an earlier video I posted on my channel uh, about whether or not early treatment with stimulant medication predisposes children with ADHD to later higher likelihood of abuse of drugs generally and stimulants in particular. And as you know, in that particular review, I talked about a variety of studies, all of which did not find any evidence that treatment with stimulants in childhood, regardless of the duration of treatment, was linked in any way to an elevated risk for drug use later in life, particularly use of stimulants. So, uh, and there were many studies, as I reported there, uh, that we summarized that found that conclusion. Uh, and then now we have the largest study to date being published last week in the Journal of Child Psychology and Psychiatry by my uh, colleagues and good friends up at Mass General Hospital. And in this paper, they are using the database of 150,000 students in 10th through 12th grade that are part of the survey called Monitoring the Future. And they do annual surveys of these students. Uh, and the current surveys go between 2005 and 2020. But the important thing here is they're using a large population-based sample. They're looking here at the extent to which stimulant treatment in childhood and stimulant treatment that lasted for years that began in childhood is linked to a later risk for the misuse of prescription stimulants uh, or for the use during the past year of cocaine or methamphetamine. What did the study find? Just as in my earlier commentary, this study also finds that youth who initiated early stimulant therapy as children under nine years of age and who were on therapy for a longer duration, six years or longer, did not have a significant increase in the use of any of these stimulant medications uh, compared with the control group that did not have ADHD and, of course, was not medicated in childhood. So this study, using a huge population sample, replicates all of the earlier studies that were done largely with clinical samples in finding no risk of childhood treatment with stimulants predisposing to later stimulant use. So a very important finding there. Again, more reassurance that we're not creating an increase in drug abuse, particularly for stimulants, by giving stimulant drugs to these children. Interestingly, this is the first study, however, that looked at whether or not stimulant treatment had been initiated after 10 years of age and was of a short duration, less than a year. And what the study found is that for that group that had late starting treatment and didn't stay on it very long, there was a significantly increased risk that these individuals would be using cocaine or prescription stimulants during the past year. So there appears to be this tiny little group of individuals that carries a risk. Now, this has nothing to do with the old idea that taking stimulants sensitizes you to become more likely to abuse a stimulant later. If anything, it, it refutes that because it's showing that the greater risk of misuse of stimulants occurred in people who took stimulants late and didn't take it for very long. Well, that is just flies in the face of the stimulant sensitivity hypothesis that was behind all of these concerns about drug treatment. What it is suggesting is that kids who are being put, being put on medication late and for a short period of time 
are a very different group of individuals. They may already be at risk for stimulant misuse. They may have been using it even earlier before they went on stimulant medication. Uh, certainly, once they try stimulant medication, looks like they, if they don't stay on it, they may be prone to going out and seeking stimulant prescriptions, illegally, of course, uh, later. So uh, there's a lot of explanations that go on in possibly accounting for this, but clearly it doesn't have to do with sensitizing children, because if it did, then we would see stimulant abuse later being associated with the longer you stayed on your medication, the more likely you were to abuse the, medic or the abuse stimulants, excuse me. Now, along with this study in the journal, there is also a commentary by friends and colleagues of mine uh, at the University of Pittsburgh, uh, Tracy Kennedy and Brooke Molina, in which they go through the study in detail, talk about its importance uh, and its implications, and basically say what I've already said here uh, about the fact that this study doesn't provide evidence that stimulant treatment of children predisposes to stimulant abuse later on. But it does raise an interesting hypothesis about a very small subgroup of children who might be at risk even more so than ADHD kids are with, for abusing stimulants. But it has nothing or very little to do with whether they took stimulant medication. That just seems to be a marker for abuse later if they started late and used it very little, that is the prescription stimulant. Uh, so a, a somewhat complicated topic. They go into all the nuances about this risk. Uh, but I think a very important paper given the size of the sample. So if you're interested, go have a look at the study and this commentary. Moving right along, I want to talk about a paper that I found fascinating. Uh, you may not, uh, but it's the first paper that I've seen on this topic at all. And that is an assessment of what is called glymphatic functioning in children with ADHD. So let me move over here quickly and show you what they're talking about. The glymphatic system in the central nervous system is a system in which the cerebral spinal fluid that coats, soaks, nourishes, and cleanses the uh, unwanted byproducts out of the brain and dumps them into the lymph system. So here we see the cerebral spinal fluid. It's circulating around and through the brain. Uh, and then it is cleaned out by membranes in the glymphatic system, and the unwanted or toxic compounds are then removed into the lymphatic and uh, blood system. So uh, a very important system for maintaining our cerebral spinal fluid and cleansing it, uh, and that's what this paper was taking a look at. So uh, that just acquaints you with what is this lymphatic system. What did the paper find? It found that children with ADHD had larger volumes within this system uh, and compared to typically developing children. However, it also found that they had smaller clearing of the system that is less clearing of the uh, cerebral spinal fluid through the lymphatic system than did the typically developing group. So it looks like there's got more room in the lymphatic system for the flow of cerebral spinal fluid, but less clearing of the toxic substances out of the uh, cerebral spinal fluid through this lymphatic system. So the study concludes, uh, as it says here, our study suggests that the lymphatic system alternation may participate in the pathogenesis of ADHD. That's possible. It's also possible that the genetics of ADHD not only predisposes to problems with the development of brain networks, but also to problems with the development and functioning of this lymphatic system. So uh, I'm not so sure I would agree with the authors about this sort of possible causal interpretation of their findings. Their results are really correlational in nature. But nonetheless, it's the first paper that I've seen that even looked at this lymphatic system in kids with ADHD. Uh, this was published over in the journal European Radiology, uh, and I think a, a very 
significant paper, a landmark paper, in the possibility of glymphatic problems linked to ADHD. So I hope you find that informative as well. Uh, the third paper I want to talk about uh, has to do with alternative and complementary medicines for ADHD. This uh, is an interesting paper published in the Journal of Integrative and Complementary Medicine, and it's a randomized trial of homeopathic treatment for children and youth with ADHD. And it's actually a pretty well done study. It uses three arms, meaning three different groups of participants in the study. Group one gets both homeopathic remedy, that is the uh, prescription believed to be important for a homeopathic cure or treatment for ADHD. So they're getting the homeopathic medicine and they're getting consultation with a homeopathic professional periodically. So that's treatment group one. Treatment group two is getting the homeopathic consultation, but is also getting a placebo. And then in group three, you have treatment as usual and customary in this particular community, which is Toronto, Canada. Uh, so they're looking at children between 6 and 16. They've randomly assigned the children to these three treatments that is going to allow them to make some kind of statement about the value of homeopathic remedy medicine, consultation, and usual care. And what did they find? Well, the results showed that both of the groups that got the consultation with the homeopath did equally as well, but were better in their improvements compared to treatment as usual. Now, that sounds like a win for homeopathic medicine, but remember, group one and two, they got the remedy, and group two got the placebo. So as the study concludes here, the homeopathic remedy in and of itself was not associated with improvements in ADHD symptoms. But something about being able to periodically consult with a practitioner, in this case a homeopathic practitioner, appeared to be of value to these families. Uh, they reported not only an improvement in their children's symptoms compared to the treatment as usual group, but also with their own coping as parents. That all sounds very positive for homeopathic practitioners, but let's understand something. We don't know what the usual care group was getting or if they got anything at all. Uh, there's no report in the paper about what those kids got. There's no report about whether any of them got medicine. Indeed, there's no report here whether pe people who got the homeopathic treatment initiated medication treatment. The only requirement was to be in the study that if you were already getting treatment, you had to stay on a stable dose throughout the course of the study. So if you already had it, you had to stay on it. Uh, and that's important so that we cannot conclude that it was really stimulant treatment that helped these individuals. Nevertheless, there's no report here of what percentage of kids across these groups were already getting medication, what percentage of kids started medication in this study after the treatment began, because they were allowed to do that, particularly in the usual care group, or whether the usual care group got anything at all. So to me, I think what this study is saying is that consulting with a professional periodically, if you have a child with ADHD, may be helpful to you in coping with the ADHD and maybe you report some decline in symptoms. But the use, use of the homeopathic remedy itself, which is really the important variable here, did not impact ADHD treatment at all. So uh, if you want, go over and have a look at the study. Uh, as you see, it was over in that journal on integrative and complementary medicine, and the hot link is in the thumbnail sketch. So lastly, I want to talk about this particular study, which is a study uh, out of the Journal of Neuroscience that examines the extent to which adults with ADHD have motivational deficits, that is a deficit in the capacity to invest effort in difficult cognitive tasks, uh, and then the extent to which treating them with amphetamine 
might help them with that motivation. So kind of a very interesting study that kind of riffs off of my earlier video on ADHD as motivation deficit disorder because it essentially affirms that conclusion. So the authors point out that their results, by the way, the study I think was done in uh, Australia, uh, but they point out that their study had three basic findings of import. First, individuals with ADHD were found to have lower motivation to invest effort in both a cognitive and a physical challenging task than did typical peers. So evidence there that there really is a motivational deficit in th with this disorder. Second, they found that amphetamine given to certain of these individuals increased their motivation to perform these tasks. The third conclusion is that the degree to which the amphetamine improved it brought them up to the level of motivation of typical people. It normalized their motivational efforts. So I think several significant findings out of this paper as well. So I hope you found these studies to be informative and that you find these weekly research updates to be of value to you. Uh, if you do, come back again. If you haven't subscribed to this channel, please do so. Uh, and if you like what you're hearing, please share this channel with others you know who might find it helpful. Uh, so thanks again, everybody. Looking forward to National Talk Like a Pirate Day next Tuesday, September 19th here in the U.S. So uh, enjoy, everybody, and stay smiling, keep laughing. Russ Barkley, signing off.